And the focus of this unit is cell division. And we learned in pre-AP that there's two types of cell division. We have mitosis and meiosis. Now, in this unit, I'm just going to focus on mitosis, and I'm barely going to mention meiosis. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not ultimately going to have to learn meiosis, but I'm going to talk more about meiosis when we get in the genetics unit. One reason why I'm going to separate them into two units is because sometimes whenever I teach ideas or concepts that are really similar to each other, then students will start mixing up the ideas between the two different concepts. So we're going to put them in separate units. Now the emphasis in this lecture is the cell cycle. Remember the three stages of the cell cycle. And we're going to talk about one type of nuclear division, which is mitosis. And we're going to talk about cyclin and cyclin-dependent kinases and how they relate to a cell moving through the different stages of the cell cycle. Now, since we're talking about mitosis and not meiosis in this unit, then we're going to be talking about division of your body cells. And the other name for body cells, the more technical term for body cells, is somatic cells. So your somatic cells divide by mitosis, and here's a few reasons why. Remember that at one time you were one cell big and you were called a zygote. Now to grow from one cell to a multicellular organism, mitosis occurs. One cell divides into two and then two divides into four and so on. So we say that one purpose of mitosis is to grow an organism. Now throughout your life you have fallen down, you've skinned your knees, you've broken bones, and so you need mitosis to repair. Now remember that cells have to maintain a small size because if cells get too big, then it's going to create this low surface to volume ratio. And that's not good for cells. We need cells to maintain a high surface to volume ratio so they can efficiently exchange materials with the environment. So when a cell gets really big, it's going to split into two smaller cells. And those small cells are going to have a high surface to volume ratio to exchange materials with the environment. Now I'm also going to introduce another term here. We want cells to have a high genome to volume ratio. If you remember, I've had my genome sequenced. So think about what genome means if I say that I've had my genome sequenced. When we're talking about genome, then we're talking about someone's DNA and we're talking about the genes that they inherited. So um, they sequenced my DNA and they sent me a report that basically told me the genes that I possess. So that's what we mean by genome. Remember your DNA codes for proteins and so if we have a high genome to volume ratio then that means that the DNA is going to be able to be transcribed fast enough to meet the protein demands of the volume or the contents of the cell. A cell that has a low genome to volume ratio would not be able to produce proteins fast enough to meet the cell demand. So we want cells, again, with that high genome to volume ratio. Now I'm just going to briefly mention meiosis here, just so that we can review again. Mitosis is to heal and grow. Meiosis was so that you could sexually reproduce. So whenever organisms reach a certain age, they hit puberty, then they're starting to do meiosis in specialized cells called those germ cells. And meiosis makes those reproductive cells, which you see here. And those cells were going to fertilize one another to create that zygote, that zygote that can go through mitosis. So mitosis is to heal and grow, and meiosis is to sexually reproduce. Now something that's kind of interesting about this diagram that I'm showing you here that's trying to show you the life cycle of humans and how that relates to mitosis and meiosis, it is really hard to find a diagram where these people are not naked. I'm not kidding. Google life cycle of humans, mitosis, meiosis. And I'm just telling you, every single picture that shows up, it starts with people and, and they're always naked. So I'm just excited I can finally find a picture of people that have clothes on. Now, when we're talking about mitosis, it's not really cell division. Mitosis is actually just the division of the nucleus. Technically, when we're dividing the nucleus, we're dividing up the DNA. So there's many terms related to DNA that you have to understand before we can talk about mitosis and the division of the nucleus. So one thing about DNA is that its structure changes throughout a cell's cycle or throughout the life cycle of a cell. When DNA is unwound or uncondensed, it looks more like this. And sometimes we say that it looks stringy 
or we can say that it is in chromatin form. So if we have DNA and it's in chromatin form, then that means it's uncondensed. It kind of looks like a string. It's not wound up into a chromosome. I like to take my eye and do this to it so that you remember that chromatin is DNA in stringy form. So I'm kind of showing you a string there. Now, right before a cell divides, DNA in chromatin form is going to coil up. And it can't coil up on its own. It actually has to coil around proteins, and those proteins are called histones. And you see those histones right there. And we've talked about histones in a previous unit. If I give you a string and I ask you to coil it up, you'll probably start coiling it around your finger. So those histones just serve as a base or something that the DNA can coil around. Now before the cells divide again, they're going to coil up DNA or they're going to condense their DNA and it now forms those chromosomes. So if you have a cell and it has DNA in chromatin form, when we take a look at that cell underneath the microscope, you're going to see a nucleus and that's pretty much it. You can't see the DNA that's in the nucleus because it's in chromatin form. Now, if a cell is dividing or it's in preparation, very close to dividing, the DNA will coil up and you will actually see X's. So again, you can see DNA when it's in chromosome form, but you can't see DNA under a microscope whenever it's in chromatin form. I feel that students get confused when we're talking about chromosomes and what we mean by sister chromatids and sometimes we say that there's an uncopied chromosome versus a copied chromosome. So I want to take a second to address these terms before we actually get into mitosis and the division of the DNA in a nucleus. If we have a cell and it has uncopied chromosomes, so let's say this cell is diploid and the abbreviation for diploid is 2N, let's say it has a diploid number of 4 then what I would see in that cell or in that nucleus, if we could coil up that DNA, is we would see four chromosomes that look like this. So when we draw them like this, that means we have uncopied chromosomes. Before a cell divides, then it's going to copy its DNA. And that's called DNA replication. So each chromosome is going to make a copy of itself. So this one will copy, this one will copy, copy, and copy. And after a chromosome copies itself, whenever the DNA coils up, it doesn't look like a single line anymore. It looks like an X. So I think of this first chromosome, this one right here, when it copies itself, then you have, an other side of, you have the other side of that X. This one is going to copy itself, so we have another X there. Third chromosome makes a copy, and that fourth chromosome makes a copy. Now when the cell splits, we're going to end up with one side of each of these copied chromosomes going into each of the daughter cells. So this daughter cell is going to get four chromosomes. This daughter cell is going to get four chromosomes. And when we look at these chromosomes, since they're a single line, I want you to think these are uncopied chromosomes. Okay, so again, a copied chromosome is going to look like an X. An uncopied chromosome is just going to look like a single line. Now sometimes, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, this copied chromosome, sometimes we don't call it a copied chromosome. We call it the sister chromatids because one side of this copied chromosome, we, we call it a sister chromatid, and this is the other sister chromatid. So these sister chromatids are held together by a structure which is called a centromere. So I'm going to draw that centromere there, and it's pointing to it right there. So we say that the sister chromatids are held together by a centromere. Or we can say that after a chromosome has been copied, we now have two sister chromatids. So again, I'm just trying to work through some of the terminology because I think students get confused as when we call it a chromosome, when we call it a chromatid. But honestly, I just like to reference an X as a copied chromosome and a single line as an uncopied chromosome. And that should be good enough. One other term that I want to point out here, a kinetochore. A kinetochore is a location on the side of the sister chromatids where these spindle fibers are going to attach. So this is where we find kinetochores. So if you want to draw a line from the kinetochore up here to the actual location, and that's where the spindle fibers are going to shoot out from the centrosomes, and they're going to attach to the sister chromatids at the kinetochores. Now let's talk about this term diploid. So the abbreviation for diploid is 2N. 
So I can say these are the diploid numbers of chromosomes for these different species, or I can say these are the two in numbers for these species. And I like to think of diploid meaning the full set. This is the number of chromosomes that you should have in each of your body cells. So for humans, our diploid number is 46. For goldfish, it's 94. And obviously, you can probably tell that the amount of DNA or the amount of chromosomes or number of chromosomes in a nucleus does not mean that one species is going to be more advanced than the other. Because if that was the case, then goldfish would rule the world and we would be the ones inside of bowls instead of the other way around. So I don't want you to think that the more DNA an organism is going to have, the more advanced that species is going to be. That's just simply not the case. But you do need to have memorized that all of your body cells or the body cells of, of an organism, even the body cells of a plant, they're going to be diploid. So all somatic cells are going to have that diploid number of the species. So if this was a white blood cell from a human, when we looked in that nucleus, we should see 46 chromosomes. If we look at the nucleus of a nerve cell, we should see 46 chromosomes. And a skeletal muscle cell is multinucleic, so there should be 46 chromosomes in every single one of those nuclei. And this is a great example of how a cell is able to keep a high genome to volume ratio. Muscle cells are very long and very skinny, and one nucleus wouldn't be able to code for protein fast enough to meet the protein demands of the entire cell. So it's multinucleic, and that again is trying to maintain this high genome to volume ratio in that cell. Now a new idea that we didn't talk about in pre-AP is that each chromosome is actually one molecule of DNA. So since humans have 46 chromosomes, we would say that we have 46 molecules of DNA. And each molecule of DNA will wind up into a chromosome. Now I have one more idea that I want to talk about before we jump into the cell cycle, starting with interphase, going through mitosis, and then going through cytokinesis. I want to make sure you understand this big idea behind mitosis and the reason why we usually will capitalize that TOS in mitosis. Remember in pre-AP that means two of the same. TOS. Mitosis gives us two cells that have the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So if we said that this parent cell had a diploid number of 40, if it divides by mitosis, you have to know that those daughter cells would be identical to the parent cell. They would also have a diploid number of 40. If I show a diagram like this, we can tell that the diploid number in this situation is 2 because there's two chromosomes. The cell has copied its chromosomes. But if you look here at the end, we get two daughter cells. They look identical to the parent cell. So even if this diagram wasn't labeled mitosis, you should be able to understand that this is showing you mitosis because we end up with two daughter cells that were the same as the parent cell. Now this is a great time to introduce a new idea to you. Whenever the DNA here copies itself, technically I have four chromosomes. There's one here, one here, one here, and one here. Now since this cell has a double set of DNA, it's no longer two in. It's actually a foreign cell. So take two in times it by two. This cell's a tetraploid, so 2N is diploid, and 4N actually means a tetraploid. And that tetraploid cell has four chromosomes. So think about this. If we take this 4N cell, if we divide it into two, then we'll have a 2N cell, and those 2N cells are going to have two chromosomes in them. They're going to be back to being diploid. We take a tetraploid cell, we divide it into two, you're going to end up with two diploid cells. Now let's relate that to this next diagram. I'm going to ask you, what is the 2N number of this original parent cell? All you have to do is count the uncopied chromosomes. It's starting off with six, and you can tell that DNA replication has occurred because you see that each of these six now looks like an X. So we say the chromosomes have been copied. So technically, this cell is a foreign cell, and it has 12 chromosomes in it. If we take this tetraploid cell and we divide it into two, I'm going to get two cells, and they're each going to be two in, and they're each going to have six chromosomes in them. And then lots of times we'll see diagrams like this, and they'll give you information like 
the zygote has a diploid number of 20. If the zygote divides by mitosis two times, then how many chromosomes should be in each of those daughter cells? It doesn't matter how many times these cells divide. If they're dividing by mitosis, then all of these daughter cells are going to have the same chromosome number as that original parent cell. So you could mark every single one of these as diploid cells with 20 chromosomes in them. Again, just to reference meiosis, just briefly, mitosis gives you two cells that are the same as the parent. Meiosis is the division that splits chromosome number in half. So if we have, for humans, which is our diploid number is 46, if this is a human sperm cell, it's a haploid cell, and we use an N to abbreviate haploid, and it would have 23 chromosomes in it. If this is a human egg cell, it's haploid, and it also would have 23 chromosomes in it if it's a normal egg cell. Now the purpose of this page is to give you an overview of the three main stages of the cell cycle. So when we talk about the cell cycle, I'm really talking about the lifespan of the cell. And we're going to start with the cell um, at its earliest age and we're going to walk it through its life and all the different stages in its life until we get to the end. Now we don't really call it a lifespan, we call it a life cycle because whenever a cell makes it all the way through the cell cycle, and I'm going to show you where we're going to start here. We're going to start here. This is the beginning of this individual cell. When it makes it all the way around through the cell cycle, then it splits into two cells. And then those cells start again in this cell cycle. So there's really no end to these cells, so to speak, because as soon as they get to the end of their cell cycle, then they split. And then those two individual daughter cells, then they begin the cell cycle as well. So with us, we don't have a cell cycle. We have a lifespan because we have a beginning and then we have the end. But when we get to the end of our life, we don't split in two. Um, we pass away. So that's not the case with the cell. And that's why we call it a life cycle and not the lifespan of a cell. So there's three main stages of the cell cycle. The first and longest one is interphase. And interphase is represented by the parts that um, are in blue. So interphase is all of this. So if you want to label that interphase. And then the second part, when the cell has been signaled to divide, that next stage we call it mitosis. And it's mitosis if it's a somatic cell or a body cell dividing. But if this was actually a germ cell that was going to form reproductive cells, then whenever it gets through interphase, it doesn't go through mitosis, it goes through meiosis to divide up its nucleus. But, but since this is a somatic cell, somatic cells perform or do or complete mitosis. And again, mitosis is really just the division of the nucleus. After the DNA has been divided up or the chromosomes have been divided up, then the cell will start cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is really just the division of the cytoplasm and all the organelles. So collectively, these two are necessary for cell division. Interphase is really just the cell um, at a time whenever it's doing the processes that it needs to do to support the life processes of the body. Um, it's also the time when it's getting ready to divide. But really, mitosis and cytokinesis are the stages involved whenever the cell is actively dividing. So let's indicate those are a time of cell division. Now, interphase itself is actually divided into three phases. I'm going to move this down a little bit that you can see interphase is divided into G1, S, and G2. Now I've already mentioned that interphase is the longest phase of the cell cycle. So if you take a look at a sample of tissue, then you're going to see that most of those cells that are in that tissue, they're going to be in interphase. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to have to give you a sample of tissue and you're going to look at all these cells that make up that tissue sample and you're going to have to identify what stage of the cell cycle these cells are in. So you're going to be looking and someone else is going to be tallying for you and you're going to be looking in the microscope saying interphase, 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 prophase, interphase, telophase, 
interphase, 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 cytokinesis. So most of the cells that you're going to say is interphase because that's the longest stage of the cell cycle. Just as a, an example, um, if you go to, let's just go to a Chiefs game, if you take a look at the sample of the population that's there, you'd probably say most of the people there are adults. And it's simply because the adult stage is the longest stage of our life. So from 18 on, you're an adult. So since it's such a long stage in our life, then the majority of people that we hear on our planet is going to be uh, considered an adult. Let's give a general description of what happens in each one of these phases. So again, we're going to start here. This is a new cell. So if you want to indicate this is a, a new cell that was formed whenever another cell divided into. So here's a new cell, and it's starting a cell cycle. It's starting off an interphase, specifically G1 of interphase. This is where the cell grows to its mature size. So it's going to start off pretty small, but then it's going to grow, and it's just performing its normal processes, what it's supposed to do for that living organism. And if this cell gets a signal that it needs to divide, then that cell is going to enter into S phase. So let's just put that during this time, it's received a signal. So now the cell is going to enter in S phase. I want you to think of S phase, or that S, meaning synthesis. And what is exactly being synthesized is DNA. And another word for DNA synthesis is DNA replication. If you replicate something, like you replicate a painting, that means that you're painting the exact same painting. You're making a copy of it. I want to emphasize, though, that DNA replication does not occur unless the cell gets a signal that it needs to divide. And only then does it need to make an extra copy of the DNA so that there's two copies, one for each daughter cell. Now, after the DNA has been copied, that cell is going to move into G2 phase. And this is like the last phase to prepare before division actually begins. So that DNA that was just copied, it's being checked for mutations. The cell is going to split into two, so there's going to be some additional organelles that need to be synthesized, so we have enough for each of those two daughter cells. And certain genes are expressed or activated to make specific proteins that are needed for the cell to divide. And just to give you an example of that, genes that code for the protein tubulin are going to be expressed at a higher rate, simply because tubulin is a protein that makes up microtubules. And you're going to see what microtubules do here in a little bit, but they're necessary for cell division. So we have to make the proteins that make up these structures that are going to assist in cell division. Now before we go into mitosis and start talking about cell division, um, I want to mention this phase right here, this GO phase. And so if we have cells that are in GO phase, we say that they are arrested. Basically, what that means is these are cells that are not going to divide. They're just in geo phase. We say that they've exited the cell cycle. There's some cells that never divide, and we say they're permanently in geo phase. So some examples of cells that cannot divide would be nerve cells, muscle cells, and the reason behind that is they're just too complex. Eventually, you're going to study neurons or nerve cells, and you're going to see that they're not just this easy little round circular cell that can pinch in two. They're very, very complex. Same with muscle cells. They are chock full of an arrangement of proteins. Those proteins assist in muscle cell contraction, and you just can't split up a muscle cell in two. So they're too complex, and so they wouldn't be able to divide. There are some cells that are, we say are arrested in geophase, um, and then, if needed, they will start to divide again. And an example of that would be your liver cells. So that's your overview of interphase, and then just a quick overview of mitosis and cytokinesis, and then we're going to see what the cell actually looks like as it goes through all of these stages of the cell cycle. So again, mitosis is nuclear division. We capitalize that TOS because it means two of the same. So with this type of nuclear division, we're going to ensure that the chromosome number of the daughter cells is going to be the same number as what that parent cell began with. There's four stages of mitosis. You might just remember PMAT in that order. So we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then after nuclear division is complete, that's when cytokinesis begins.
Now's the time when it's handy if you can get four different colors of colored pencils to help you diagram what we're going to attempt to show you with some different chromosomes in the cell that we're going to split into. Now before we take you through what the cell is going to look like in each of these stages of the cell cycle, I want to talk about this diagram right here. Many times you're going to be shown a cell like this and they say this is the original cell or this is the parent cell. You should be able to count it and understand that this is a diploid cell that has four chromosomes because there's one, two, three, four. And they're oftentimes going to predict what the cell would look like if it was in metaphase of mitosis. Or what would the daughter cells look like that came from this parent cell if it divided by mitosis. So again, you have to remember that when we're done dividing this cell by mitosis, this is exactly what the two daughter cells are going to look like. They're going to look like a, uh, an exact copy of that parent cell. They're going to be diploid cells with four chromosomes. Now, this cell that starts off in G1. So I have a cell here that it doesn't have copied chromosomes. It's in G1. It's starting the cell cycle. It really doesn't look like this. But we have to sometimes draw it like this so that you understand this cell starts out with four chromosomes because this is how we diagram a chromosome. Specifically, that's an uncopied chromosome. But again, the cell really doesn't look like this because in interphase, G1, S, and G2, the DNA is not coiled up into chromosomes. It's in chromatin form. So really what a cell looks like is just a normal cell sitting there with a nucleus, and you can't see any chromosomes in the nucleus. Since the DNA is in chromatin form, you can't see it. So, but to show you that it's this, this cell that we're going to divide is a diploid cell with four chromosomes. Um, and just to represent that the DNA hasn't been copied yet and it hasn't coiled up yet, what I want you to do is I want you to grab those different colored pencils. You need four different colors. And we're just going to draw four chromosomes in chromatin form. So I will draw a pile with one color. So this is DNA, and it's in chromatin form. So that's one molecule DNA. That will eventually coil up into one chromosome. Take a different color, but I'm not going to be able to show you that with this smart board. And make another pile. So make that red. And then maybe make this one green. And then this one blue. So really, whenever you see a cell in G1 of interphase, you don't even see the stringy DNA or anything like that. It really looks like just a cell, and you can't really see anything in the nucleus. It just looks like a circle there in the middle. When this cell gets a signal to divide, then it's actually going to go into the next phase of interphase, that S phase. And again, S stands for synthesis, so the DNA is getting copied. So what I would like for you to do is take those colors again, and I want you to make that pile of DNA twice as big or twice as thick. So really show that there's twice as much DNA now. So this molecule of DNA has been copied. So double up the pile of red. Double up the pile of green, double up the pile of blue, just to emphasize that the DNA has been copied or it's been replicated. Technically, since we've doubled the amount of DNA, that we've doubled the amount of chromosomes in this cell, this is a tetraploid. It's a foreign cell, and it has eight chromosomes now that we're going to see here in a little bit when the DNA finally coils up. Again, in G2, this is final preparations for cell division. Again, we're making more proteins. We're making more organelles to make sure there's plenty for the two different daughter cells that are going to result. So if you want to show the DNA in this cell, it's just like what it was. You just have a doubled pile of each of those chromosomes. So just basically draw the DNA the exact same way that you drew it above in that S phase. And before we go into mitosis, I just want to show you where we're at. We've made it all the way through the cell cycle at the end of G2, and we are right here. And the cell is just about ready to actively divide. We can tell that mitosis, or cell division, has started because at this time, we're going to see that nucleus, or that nuclear membrane, is going to start to disappear. And as soon as we see that, and as soon as we see that the DNA is starting to coil up and form chromosomes, then we know that we're at the end of G2 and that division is occurring. We have officially started mitosis. So on this page, 
I have the stages of mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And as I just mentioned, if we see that this DNA, this copied DNA, is starting to coil up or condense, is the official term for that, into chromosomes, copied chromosomes, so they're going to look like X's. I could also say the DNA is coiling up into sister chromatids. I'm talking about the exact same structures. I'm talking about these X's here. Again, the DNA looks like X's because they were copied in S phase of interphase. So we see the DNA is starting to coil up into chromosomes. I already mentioned that nuclear membrane is going to disappear because we have to move the X's or the chromosomes around. So we need to make room to move them around in the cell. Now the term centrosome is new to you. And we just say that the centrosome is kind of the area around the centrioles. We're going to start to see spindle fibers starting to form. Spindle fibers are microtubules that are made of tubulin. And so if I was going to identify what a centrosome was, I would say this, this area, this, the structure that we're starting to see kind of take shape here, that's the centrosome. We have two of them. Here's the other centrosome. Inside that centrosome, like I said, we have a centriole. We have talked about centrioles before. So centrioles, they come in pairs, and they kind of look like a cylinder. So think of like an oatmeal container. The actual function of the centriole is unknown or it's debatable because we know that plant cells, they form spindle fibers, and they can divide just fine without centrioles. And I do believe there's been some experiments where in the middle of animal cell division, they've removed the centrioles, and the animal cells continue to divide with no problem. And again, the spindle fibers, spindle fibers are these little lines that we see start to develop there. And as I mentioned, they're just a type of cytoskeleton. Remember, there's three types of cytoskeleton. Spindle fibers are actually microtubules, but they form specifically during cell division, so we have a kind of a different name for them. Eventually, these spindle fibers are going to elongate, and they're going to hook onto the kinetochores on both sides of this copied chromosome. So some are going to hook to this side, to that kinetochore, and some are going to hook to this kinetochore. And these spindle fibers are ultimately going to move these chromosomes around. Now, the chromosomes are going to start to move, and when they officially line up in the middle, then we call that metaphase. So remember, M for metaphase and N for middle. Now, before I go on, we just completed prophase before we got into metaphase. And if you remember, pro usually means before or at the beginning. So that's why that phase was named prophase, because pro means at the beginning. So in metaphase, we have those chromosomes that are lined up in the middle. And that's pretty much all you need to remember for metaphase. I want you to think of, for anaphase, A for anaphase, A for apart. This is when those sister chromatids, remember each side of that copy chromosome is called a sister chromatid, they are pulled apart at the centromere. The centromere was that protein belt that was holding the two sister chromatids together. Remember, one side of that X is an exact copy of the other side of the X. Now, in telophase, which is the last part of mitosis, um, we have basically events that are taking place that are the opposite of what happened in prophase. So I tell students that really if you memorize prophase, then when you get to telophase, then think about just everything happening backwards. Remember in prophase, we condensed the DNA. Well, now we're going to uncoil them in telophase. The nuclear membrane disappeared in prophase. It's going to reform, and you can see that it's reforming here around those two different sets of DNA. The spindle fibers that were formed in prophase are going to be disassembled. They're not needed anymore. And also, as these two nuclei are starting to form there, cytokinesis is already beginning. And that's that third official stage of the cell cycle. And so, again, what we mean by cytokinesis is there's the division of the cytoplasm so, and the division of the organelles. So if you want to show some organelles moving over here and some moving over here, they're actually kind of getting pushed and pulled around by the cytoskeleton as well to make sure there's uh, an even distribution of cytoplasm and organelles in those two daughter cells. And whenever we're done, you should always check for a couple different things. First off is those daughter cells should be identical to that original cell. So you can go back to the previous page, page four, and look at that original cell and what it would have looked like if we could actually see the 
DNA condensed into chromosomes. Remember, it's, it was a 2N equals 4 cell. And so if you think about, here's a chromosome, 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 chromosome. So it would look like this whenever we're officially done. And this one would have four chromosomes as well. I would say always go back and look at these daughter cells at the end of any type of division. I don't care if it's mitosis or meiosis. You better not have excess. There will never be excess at the end of cell division. You're going to have single chromosomes, never excess. If you see that you have excess when you get down here at the end of telophase, um, then you've done something wrong. Now we've reached that final stage of the cell cycle, cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is going to look a little bit different depending on whether we're looking at animal cells or plant cells. Because animal cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane and we lack a cell wall. And then the plasma membrane is going to pinch in and it's going to form a structure which is called the cleavage furrow. So this indent right there is called the cleavage furrow. So we know what cleavage looks like, um, but a furrow actually looks like this as well. If you've ever done any gardening and you go to plant your seeds, you have to dig a little trench there. It looks like a little V and then you drop your seeds in there. So that's called a furrow. So we just combine the two terms and that's called the cleavage furrow. We do not see cleavage furrows happen in plant cells because they have that cell wall on the outside. So this cell can't be pulled together there in the middle um, like we see in those animal cells. So what has to happen is we have to build a wall in the middle of these two daughter cells because we're going to end up with a daughter cell here and a daughter cell over here and we need to build the wall in the middle. So that wall is built by the Golgi releasing these vesicles that contain the molecules that make up the plant cell wall. So vesicles from the Golgi, and you see the Golgi right here, so let's go ahead and label that. And you can see the little circles there coming off the Golgi, those are the vesicles, and they move to the center and that's where they break over and they spill their contents there in the middle of the cell and those contents will go on to form that cell wall. Initially, this is called a cell plate, but eventually that cell plate turns into the cell wall. So if you're looking at two different tissue samples and you see cells that are more round and you can see that cleavage furrow starting to form between cells, then you know you're looking at an animal cell. If you see more of a square type cell and you see a structure that is kind of forming in the middle and you have two nuclei, then you know you're looking at a plant cell in cytokinesis. Now we've taken a cell all the way from G1 all the way through interphase and we divided it by mitosis and cytokinesis and now we have daughter cells, specifically two daughter cells from one parent cell. These daughter cells are going to become specialized. They're going to mature and they're going to develop traits that help them perform a specific task for the organism. Whenever they become specialized, the term for that is differentiation. Are we, sell, are we say the cells differentiated? So when unspecialized cells become specialized, then we say these cells have differentiated. So I wanted to give you a few examples of where we see cells differentiating. Even as an adult, you have cells that are dividing, you're getting new daughter cells, and those cells are differentiating. Sometimes when we think of differentiation, I think students um, just think about cells of an embryo that are going to become specialized as that organism develops. But you have adult cells that are differentiating as well. I like this diagram. It's not the sharpest, but I like the fact that it shows you um, a piece of bone here and it's showing you the bone marrow because that is where we have cells that are actively dividing and these cells will then become specialized. So right now we have an unspecialized cell that was developed or formed due to mitosis or cell division in the bone marrow. And this cell, depending on the signals that it receives from the environment, it can turn into different types of cells. Um, it can turn into this cell, which will then specialize to become this cell. And these are actually, these are red blood cells, erythrocytes. Or they can differentiate into platelets, and platelets um, are necessary for blood clotting. And then we see a bunch of other different types of cells over here, and someday you're going to be able to recognize that these are white blood cells. So again, it started off with the production of a daughter cell due to cell division of the cells in the bone marrow, and those cells become specialized. Plant cells will differentiate and become specialized as well. There's different types of plant cells. There's mesophyll cells, there's cells that make up the xylem, there's cells that make up the phloem. They all have different names and you're probably never going to have to 
uh, know what they are. In the old AP class, we had to know that. But um, some cells like are called tracheids, and then there's vessel elements, and there's palisade cells. So there's different types of cells in plants as there are in animals. So I want to show you that this is a root tip, and we have cell division happening in areas of growth. And so there's a high rate of cell division here, right behind what's called the root cap. And as this area gets more and more cells, then what it does is it pushes that root cap further down into the ground. And so this is um, showing you the growth of a root. Now, these cells that are up here are actually older. They were formed earlier. These cells eventually get pushed this away as more and more new cells are being formed in this area. So these are older cells up here, and they're starting to differentiate. So it's showing you that here these cells are developing different traits that allow them to be specialized and perform specific tasks for the plant. So even plant cells will differentiate. And then down here, I'm just showing you, this is a blastocyst. And so the blastocyst um, develops due to cell division, starting with the zygote. So the zygote divides into two cells and four cells and so on. Whenever you look like a hollow basketball, we call you a blastocyst. And eventually then um, you're going to develop more and more into that embryo. But I wanted to emphasize that these are unspecialized cells. But over time, they're going to become specialized. Or we say that they're going to differentiate into different cells of the body. In this unit, whenever we go to lab, we're going to be taking a look at tissue samples. And I want you to be able to identify different stages of the cell cycle, especially being able to identify cells that are actively dividing. And I want you to be able to see cells in, in prophase, and metaphase, and anaphase, and telophase. Now, I hope you understand that if I need you to be able to look at cells that are dividing, then I'm going to have to show you tissue samples um, from organisms where there was a lot of development and growth in those areas. So um, this is what, why I wanted to show you this root tip here, because some of the slides that you're going to look at, I've actually have a cross section of a root tip. We have cut out this area right here, and we've stained it, and we fixed those cells so that you can see these cells kind of frozen in different stages of mitosis. So again, there's lots of division taking place there. So if I need to show you cells going through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, I have to find cells that are actively dividing. If I took cells off of um, the top portion of a leaf, you're not going to be able to see prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase because there's really not uh, actively dividing cells in that area. Some of you are going to be looking at um, blastulas or um, basically something that kind of looks like this, except there's going to be more cells to it. It's going to be more like a filled-in basketball instead of a hollow basketball. Um, and before you, you know, freak out thinking that we're looking at embryos, we, we are kind of looking at embryos, but we're looking at embryos from a whitefish. We are not looking at human embryos. Just want to be specific about that. So again, just have an idea of where we would have to look at for tissue if you want to see cells that are actively dividing. We need to look um, in areas of organisms where there's um, rapid growth and development and repair of tissue if you want to see cells in the different stages of mitosis. Cell division is important in development, but I also want to talk about apoptosis, or programmed cell death. When we think of cell death, we think of it as a negative thing, but apoptosis, or cell death, is actually a normal part of development. I've included a cell and what it looks like as it's going through different stages of apoptosis. So this is the cell before apoptosis is triggered. And we can see that it's slowly degrading. And eventually we end up with a small cell fragment. And this is a macrophage that is actually going to ingest that cell and completely break it down. And down here I've included diagrams where apoptosis is occurring so that we have normal development in organisms. For this first example, you can see that um, I have basically the, the limb or the hand of a human embryo. And what this is diagramming is that in certain areas of this structure, apoptosis is occurring. You can see that with the red highlight there. If it wasn't for apoptosis, then whenever you were born, your fingers would not be individual digits. They would be all connected together. And you can see that apoptosis or cell death finally separates those individual digits. Another example where we see apoptosis in development is with tadpoles. 
there is apoptosis occurring in these cells that make up the tail. And eventually, all of those nutrients, all those proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids that make up the cells of the tail are going to be reabsorbed by the frog and reutilized. Another option would be if the tadpole just lost its tail. But if you think about it, that organism just lost a bunch of nutrients that it could have utilized in different ways. So there's actually an advantage to apoptosis during development. In this section, we're going to focus on regulation of the cell cycle. There's many proteins that are made throughout a cell's life, and these proteins assist in tasks that are necessary for life for whatever stage that cell is in. Just to give you an example, here in S phase, that's when the DNA is getting synthesized, there's proteins that synthesize the DNA. So it's important that these proteins are made during that time so that the DNA can be copied correctly. Now, before we get into some of these proteins like the cyclones and the cyclin-dependent kinases, let's first talk about the checkpoints. And you need to remember that there's three checkpoints during the cell cycle. Now, during each of these checkpoints, DNA is being analyzed to make sure that it's intact and it's in the right place so that the cell can have normal division. If a cell enters in time whenever it's considered a checkpoint, if that DNA is not intact, then a couple different things can happen. The cell can try to repair the DNA. Or if the DNA cannot be repaired, then that cell is going to apoptize. And this is important. So when regular cells get mutations in their DNA, it's important that if that cannot be fixed, that, that they will kill themselves. Otherwise, they can end up becoming cancerous cells. Now, this first checkpoint happens at the end of G1 phase. And you can see it right here. Now, let's think about what's going to happen here. The cell's obviously gotten a signal to divide, and that's why the cell is about ready to enter S phase, where it's going to copy its DNA. Before we copy DNA, it's probably important that we check it to make sure that there's no mutations in the DNA, that the DNA is intact. So that is what is happening at this first checkpoint. The cell is making sure that there's no damage to the DNA before it's getting copied. Now, a lot of students are going to think the second checkpoint happens at the end of S phase, but it's actually here. At it's at the end of G2 and right before mitosis. And this is where the cell is checking to make sure that the DNA was copied or replicated correctly. At this checkpoint, if there's errors that occurred during DNA replication, then again, the cell can either try to repair those DNA errors or the cell will apoptize. And then finally, this third checkpoint happens right here, and I'm going to draw a line here, between metaphase and anaphase. Because if the cell doesn't check out during this checkpoint, then the cell will stop dividing and will not go from metaphase to anaphase. So let's say this happens between metaphase and anaphase. At this checkpoint, the cell is making sure that all the chromosomes are attached and accounted for and they're in the middle of the cell. So it's almost like it's checking that it hasn't lost any of those copied chromosomes and that we're going to be able to divide up each of those sister chromatids and each one's going to go into a daughter cell. Again, if there's issues with the DNA, if not all the chromosomes have been lined um, at the equator, then the cell will apoptize. Now we're going to talk about two important proteins that are important in the moving of a cell through that cell cycle from stage to stage. The first protein is called cyclin, and the second one is called the cyclin-dependent kinase. And lots of times we're just going to abbreviate it the CDK. We've already talked about kinases before, and kinases are proteins that can activate other kinases by phosphorylating them. And eventually what will happen is these kinases that are being activated are going to activate this copying or the transcription of certain genes so that certain proteins needed by the cell related to that time in its life are then synthesized. Let me give you a simple example of what I mean by that. So when a cell is about ready to get to S phase, remember S phase is where the DNA is being replicated, then certain genes are going to be activated and they're going to code for proteins needed to synthesize or replicate the DNA. So one specific protein that we're going to talk about later on this unit is DNA polymerase. And there's different DNA polymerases, but they're really important in replicating DNA. 
This diagram is attempting to show you exactly how we can get proteins being made in a cell related to a specific time in the cell cycle. One thing to understand is that cells must have some kind of signal for them to divide. So here we have a ligand binding to this receptor protein. And it's going to signal this cell to divide. Now, whenever the ligand binds to this receptor protein, there's a shape change, so I want to indicate that. And that's going to activate molecules in the cytoplasm, specifically kinases. Now, there's a certain type of kinase that you might want to remember, and these are called MAP kinases. And MAP kinases are related to cell division. MAP stands for mitogen activating protein kinases. And mitogen is the combination of the word mitosis and genesis. So we're trying to generate cells through mitosis, through cell division. So that's why they're called MAP kinases. So I'm going to draw a MAP kinase there so we don't get them confused with these cyclins and these CDKs. And whenever MAP kinases activate other molecules, they phosphorylate them. So I'm going to put a P there. So now I have an active kinase, and kinases can lead to the transcription of genes. So here I have a gene that codes for cyclin, and we just talked about cyclin and cyclin-dependent kinases are important in moving a cell through the cell cycle. So once these kinases activate the transcription of these genes, then we're going to get cyclin produced. And here's some cyclin molecules. I want to add some more cyclin molecules so that you understand the concentration of cyclin is increasing in the cell now we mentioned these CDKs, these cyclin-dependent kinases, and they're inactive unless cyclin is present. So when cyclin concentrations increase, then they're going to bind with these CDK molecules. Now whenever they are bound, sometimes we refer to them as a complex. So this is a cyclin-dependent kinase cyclin complex. It's a mouthful. But we have these complexes, and when cyclin is bound to CDK, it alters the shape of it. And now that CDK can be phosphorylated. Whenever it's bound as a complex, it's not active until it is phosphorylated. So let's show that we now have an active complex. So this can lead to events that activate proteins so that we can get some certain genes transcribed. Specifically, we need to transcribe some genes that code for proteins related to the S phase. Right now, though, transcription is not going to happen. So whenever these kinases are activated, they can activate other molecules or alter them. And you can see now that this molecule has been removed. And technically, this would be a transcription factor. We're going to talk about transcription factors later on in the lecture, but any protein that regulates the transcription of a gene is called a transcription factor. So here we've removed the transcription factor when we phosphorylated it, and now transcription can begin. And this ultimately is going to lead to the production of specific proteins that are needed for the events that are going to take place in the S phase. So to summarize the main points of this diagram is that cells should not divide unless they receive a signal. That's going to activate other molecules in the cytoplasm, which will eventually lead to the production of cyclins. When cyclins bind to these CDKs, other proteins can be activated and it can lead to the transcription of genes. This diagram is showing you that there's different types of cyclins. So you can see there's a G1 cyclin, an S cyclin, and an N cyclin. And you can see that their concentration varies throughout the different stages of the cell cycle. These cyclins are made and destroyed at different times. So the concentration of cyclin varies throughout a cell's life. But I want to emphasize that the concentration of those cyclin-dependent kinases is constant. So to indicate that, I want to add a line here to represent a CDK. Let's let this line represent the concentration of this G1 CDK. And I'm just going to add another line there because there's different CDKs. So I'm just going to add another one here. And this is the concentration of the S CDK. 
again, those cyclin-dependent kinases are made and they're in the cell all the time. Sometimes they're activated if cyclin is being produced, and the rest of the time they're inactive. It is the cyclins that are made at different times and degraded, causing those CDKs to be active or inactive in different times of the cell cycle. This diagram that I included over here is out of the Cliff Notes book, and I think it's a great diagram and one that's easy to understand. So we have the different phases of the cell cycle, and so we have a cell here that's starting G1 of the cell cycle, and you can see that during this time, we're starting to get the productions of these certain cyclins, and they're binding to specific CDKs, and they're activating events related to G1. Eventually, though, these cyclins are going to be destroyed, and those specific CDK molecules are going to be inactivated, and they're no longer going to be signaling for events related to G1. Instead, we're going to be getting the production of a different type of cyclin as the cell moves from G1 to that S phase. So we're going to get different cyclins produced, and we're going to get different CDKs activated. And again, they're going to initiate events in the cell related to S phase and to G2. And then you can see over here we have the destruction of those S cyclins eventually. And then we're getting a greater concentration of a different type of cyclin now during the next stage of the cell cycle. So these M cyclins are being synthesized. They're activating these MCDKs, and that's leading to events related to the end of G2 and division during mitosis. So these cyclins and these cyclin-dependent kinases are related to checkpoints because whenever cyclin is produced and we get this specific complex being formed, if these checkpoint conditions are met, so the DNA is intact or the DNA has been replicated, then that CDK is finally activated by phosphorylation. Signaling the events in the next stage of the cell cycle. Now there's one CDK cyclin complex that I want to emphasize, and that is this one right here. And you can also see it up here. And this one has a special name. This is called the MPF as in the mitosis promoting factor. This is the one that is important for signaling cell division. And I wanted to point this out because I see that it's referenced more often than the other ones. So if you see a question that's talking about this MPF, this mitosis promoting factor, this CDK cyclin complex, then you know that cell division is about ready to begin. Without the formation of this complex, cell division would not occur. I wanted to include this diagram because I think it's important to emphasize this idea right here is that these cyclin-dependent kinases are finally inactivated whenever the cyclin is degraded. So here we have an active complex, as you can see right here, and it's promoting mitosis. And if this complex is promoting mitosis, then you have to know that it's that MPF CDK cyclin complex. But you can see that eventually this signal, which is telling the cell to go ahead and proceed into mitosis, is going to be shut off. And that's important because the cell doesn't always need to be receiving signals to divide. So that cyclin is being degraded, and you can see that this cyclin-dependent kinase, it remains in the cytoplasm, and it's just going to be inactive. And it's going to remain inactive until the cell then gets a signal to divide, copies its DNA, goes through that G2 phase, and it's now ready for division to take place, and we're, once again, we're going to see that production, that increase in concentration of that cyclin B to activate the specific cyclin-dependent kinase. Now I want to look at some example questions. So you have an idea of some questions that we could be asking you about cyclins and the regulation of the cell cycle. If you want, take a second to pause and see if you can answer some of these questions on your own. The first question is about DNA replication and the fact that there is an enzyme that we're going to talk about later in the unit named ligase, and it's its job to seal the backbones in DNA when the DNA is being replicated. So the question says, which cyclin is responsible for activating a CDK that will result in the expression of genes related to ligase? Well, since we're talking about DNA replication occurring, then I would say that cyclin E right here 
is the one that is causing the activation of these genes related to ligase. Because the cell is about ready to replicate its DNA, so it's having to make these enzymes that will assist in that. The second question says which cyclin would activate CDKs that lead to proteins that degrade the nuclear membrane? To answer this question, you have to remember specific events that happen during different phases of the cell cycle. And the nuclear membrane is being degraded in prophase of the cell cycle. So you'd have to look and see which cyclin is increasing in concentration right before prophase. Here we have mitosis, and the first phase is going to be prophase. So I would say prophase is occurring about here. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So I would say cyclin B is responsible for activating these CDKs that are related to producing enzymes that will degrade the nuclear membrane. Number three says, add a line to the graph to show how the concentration of G1 CDKs varies throughout the cell cycle. This is kind of a trick question, but I want to emphasize that it's the production and the degradation of cyclins which will cause the cell to go through the different stages of the cell cycle. The CDKs are constant, so if you just drew a line that is showing a constant concentration of CDKs, then that would be accurate. And question number four says, if cyclin B was taken from one cell and injected into a cell in G1, how would the cell in G1 respond? It looks like cyclin B is binding to that cyclin-dependent kinase and leading to that MPF complex. And remember, that complex is important for initiating cell division. And what is interesting, if you take the cytoplasm out of a cell that's in a mitotic stage and you inject it into the other one, then this cell, this G1 cell, will start dividing. And it'll start dividing without going through the S phase or the G2 phase. That cytoplasm from the cell will contain that cyclin B, and it's going to start binding to the cyclin-dependent kinases in this G1 cell, making this MPF complex, which will activate division in that G1 cell. On the AP exam, I've seen questions that have discussed this idea that if you take cytoplasm out of one cell in one stage and you inject it into another, then it's going to cause that second cell to enter that exact same stage as the initial cell that you took that sample from. What is really interesting is that you can take cyclins from a specific animal and you can inject it into cells of a different animal and that cell is going to enter whatever stage the specific cyclin is important in signaling. We've brought up this idea quite a bit related to evolution that when we have similar molecules in different species we see similar signaling pathways in different species that it indicates a common ancestor. between those two species.